Have a seat. Let me read to you a scripture from Psalm 24. Uh, just the first few verses say this. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Now here's a question. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Here we are on a morning like this and, and we're here to worship. We're here to come before our God and give him praise and thanksgiving. But who? Who can stand in his presence? Who can ascend? Listen to what the text says. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from, God, from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Do you hear what the text is saying? The question is asked, who can ascend? Who can come into the presence of God? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Now that presents a problem because my hands aren't very clean. My heart is not very pure. Even this week, right, my life was entangled with my sinful nature. Even this week, I fell short of the glory of God. And so based on this passage of scripture, like I'm, I'm not qualified to come into the presence of God this morning. But, but, and here's why we worship. Are you ready? Here's why we worship. But there is one who is qualified, who went before the presence of God for me and gave his life on a cross and died in my place and rose again to make a way for me, an unrighteous sinner, to be righteous before God. And so I come before the presence of God, not based on who I am, I come in the presence of God to worship this morning because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And my friend, that gives me reason this morning to sing, to shout uh, uh, songs of acclamation. That gives me reason this morning to praise my God because of what Christ has done for me. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you that Jesus, you have made a way for us to be a people who can come into the presence of the Father because we admit this morning, we are not a people of clean hands and a pure heart. We are a people who are sinful. We are a people who transgress your ways quite often, but yet you in your grace and your mercy and your love for us, you provide a way through your son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the only reason why we are here this morning. He is the only reason why we can lift our voices in praise. He is the only reason why our heart rejoices this morning because of what he has done for us through his death and through his resurrection. So Father, be honored this morning Morning because of your great power. Be honored this morning because of your great love for us. Be honored this morning because of what you have done for us by sending your only begotten son for us so that we could enjoy a relationship with you. Father, our desire this morning is that everyone who steps foot on this campus would have an encounter with the God of all creation. I think about our children that are meeting right now. 
I pray today that our children will know the power of God at work in their lives. That, that those volunteers who are over there right now serving with our children, uh, they will be able to help our children understand the love and grace of God. For our students who will be here meeting in life connection groups and also in this worship service, Father, that today they would know the power and presence of God at work in their lives. For every person who's in this room and who will be in this room at 11 o'clock for our second service, I pray that we would know together the power and glory of God through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, today may we know your goodness and mercy toward us and may it lead us to respond to you by giving you the worship that you are so worthy of. Thank you, God, for the work of grace that you have done in us and that you're doing through us. Father, I pray this morning for what's taking place at Northwood Baptist Berkeley and what's taking place at Northwood Baptist Wando Woods. And I thank you for our family of churches and how all over this city, you are allowing uh, the Northwood family to have a gospel influence in this city. Father, may people in this area know the good news of Jesus Christ because of our faithful witness. Lord, we love you. And we thank you this morning for your goodness to us. Be exalted, we ask, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand back up and let's continue to worship together.
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name.
All right, let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn back to 1 Corinthians with me. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 this morning. And we're going to be studying uh, all of this chapter, all 21 verses. But I'm going to read to you in just a moment down to verse 13. And so go ahead and find that in your copy of God's Word, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 13. If you're new to the Bible, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians is real easy to find. It's the seventh book in the New Testament. You can find the four Gospels. You can find... 1 Corinthians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. If you did not bring a Bible with you, that's okay because in the seat before you, down the book rack, you'll find a copy of the Bible. Pick that Bible up and find 1 Corinthians with us. If you don't own a Bible, we want you to take that Bible home with you and read it and learn about the God that loves you and desires a relationship with you. 1 Corinthians 4, we're gonna read the first 13 verses in just a moment. If you're new to our church, uh, we have been studying 1 Corinthians for a while now for about a month or so and and what we like to do at Northwood is we like to take books of the Bible like 1 Corinthians and just walk straight through them chapter by chapter verse by verse because we are convinced that God speaks to us through his word and so we want to study his word well and so again we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 this morning as we journey through this letter that the apostle Paul wrote some time ago uh, again we'll read it together in just a moment so so here's what I know about you you're probably a lot like like me, uh, that when it comes to flying, like going to the airport and getting on a plane, uh, th there's some, I don't know, like trepidation in that. Not that you fear flying. I mean, I, I don't think many, of, maybe you do, I have no idea. But that TSA thing, right? Like that whole TSA thing is just a pain. And, and just over the years, it seemed to have gotten worse. And, and, you know, you have to wait forever to go through the security check to, to get on the plane and all that kind of stuff. And, and then if you've flown recently, once you get to the place where you get that tray out and you start to put your stuff in it, like you don't know what to put in that thing. I mean, because every airport is different. And, and I flew out of Charleston not too long ago. And even in Charleston, like it seems like it's different every time what I'm supposed to do. Like sometimes they want me to take my laptop out of my bag. Sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes they want me to take my shoes and belt off. Sometimes they say, no, you can leave it on. And so, so like there's always this confusion about what I'm supposed to do when I get to the tray. And then when they tell you, like they don't tell you in a nice way what to do. They yell at you. And, and like, I don't deserve to be yelled at. I'm a pretty nice guy. So it always hurts my feelings that they yell at me, but it's just a, it's a very stressful deal. Like you wait in line for 30 minutes to get up there and you don't know what to do. And then you get yelled at, like, it's just not good. You understand what I'm saying? And I don't know if you share that frustration. Maybe, I don't know, you got the fast pass and you just walk right through that thing. I'm too cheap to buy the fast pass. Maybe I should, I have no idea. But at any rate, like that's, that's kind of what happens when you get to the airport. I, I saw this past week, this trend that's taking place on social media as people go through the TSA security line. What people are starting to do, world travelers, is they're taking the time to stop, take everything they need to take out of their bag and put it in the tray, but then they're arranging it in a very nice artistic way and then taking pictures of it to post on social media. Like, let me give you an example. That looks so pretty. Like just arranging all their stuff very nicely in the tray and, and, and then just letting that thing go on through. Like no stress, just arranging their stuff in the tray. If I ever get behind that person who does that, I'm gonna smack them, right? Like that's not what you're supposed to do. You understand? Like, like what are you thinking? Like who, who has the frame of mind to stop and put all their stuff in there nicely and then take a picture of it to post on social media? Furthermore, like... That's the worst thing you can do. Like you've got people behind you waiting to get to that line and you're gonna take the time to arrange all of your stuff nice and pretty to post a picture on social media. But that's the trend that's happening in the airports right now. So if you get behind someone who does that, pray for them or something, I don't know. Like that's not the, that's not the way it's supposed to work. All that to say, and you know this like I do, we live in a culture that is a look at me culture. I mean, social media has proven that. Look at me. Look at who I am. Look at what I'm doing. Look at me. Think about me. Accept me. Embrace me. Serve me. That's the kind of culture that you and I live in right now. And it seems like from a very young age, we are taught to be the kind of people that go after the attention of others in a negative kind of way. Serve me, think of me, look at me, accept me. And so we've kind of grown up in, in this culture, if you will, 
where we expect others to be our servants. Think of me, embrace me, serve me. And the posture that we often fail to take ourselves is the posture of a servant. I don't know if you remember this or not, but when we looked at 1 Corinthians 3 last week, this is how Paul challenges us as a church, that we're not called to be served, we are called to serve, to be servants. And I know you know that, like, that's not new information for you if you're a follower of Jesus. But let me ask you a question, and, and you might not think about this question very often, but I think this is gonna be very telling for you if you would take the time to ask yourself this question. Are you more interested in being served or are you more interested in serving? I mean, think about it. Just on a regular basis, day by day, would you rather be served or would you rather serve? I think the way you answer that question would say a lot about your heart and a lot about your growth as a follower of Jesus. Because if we're, we're real honest, a lot of us in this room, we would rather be served by others than to actually be a servant of others. This passage we're looking at this morning is very helpful. And again, what Paul is doing, he's pressing in on us, helping us to think about what it looks like to live a life in such a way that we are living as servants of God for the kingdom of God to bless other people. And what I want to show you from this text are three challenges that, that arise from the text that are going to help us to think well about what it means to actually be a servant instead of living a life that always wants to be served. Does that, does that make sense to you? So take your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Go ahead and rise to your feet as we honor the ring of God's word. 1 Corinthians 4, the first 13 verses, verses. Listen to what God's word says. Paul writes and he says this, a person should think of us in this way as servants of Christ and managers of the mysteries of God. In this regard, it is required that managers be found faithful. It is of little importance to me that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself for I am not conscious of anything against myself, but I am not justified by this. It is the Lord who judges me. So don't judge anything prematurely before the Lord comes, who will both bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the intentions of the hearts. And then praise will come to each one from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. So you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, nothing beyond what is written. The purpose is that none of you will be arrogant, favoring one person over another. For what makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? If in fact you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have begun to reign as kings without us. And I wish you did reign so that we could also reign with you. For I think God has displayed us, the apostles, in last place. Like men condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Up to the present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed, roughly, roughly treated, homeless. We labor, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we respond graciously. Even now, we are like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time together in your word this morning. And thank you that your spirit speaks to us through your word. And Father, we need your word to challenge us this morning because we do want to be the kind of people uh, that live our lives in such a way that we serve you well. And I know for all of us, we fight that temptation. We want to be served rather than to serve. We want others to notice us and, and sing our praises and give us accolades and, and do for us. And Father, we oftentimes forget that you've called us to do for others, to be a blessing, to give our lives away for the sake of the gospel. And so Father, would you please help us to listen carefully to what you're saying this morning? And would you help us to have hearts this morning that, uh, that desire to respond to your word in obedience and in faith? And so Father, we trust that right now in these moments that you are speaking to us by your spirit and that as you speak to us by your spirit, you are gonna point us to the greatness of your son, Jesus Christ. And so help us this morning to listen well for the glory of Jesus Christ. And I ask it in the name of Jesus, amen. You can have a seat. 
So here we are, and if you've been with us through this series of messages, you know in these first few chapters that Paul is really pressing in and addressing the issue of division in the church. This church is not unified. And, and, and one of the reasons why this church is not unified is because they are picking sides, right? Based on personalities. Now, if you've been with us, we've talked about this over and over again, but let me just remind you again. Uh, they're rallying around different leaders. For some in the church, hey, we really like Paul. He's our guy. For others, this Apollos guy, he's a very eloquent speaker. Uh, we, we like him because he seems so smart. He's very different than Paul. We like him. He's our guy. And Cephas, Peter, like he was actually with Jesus for three three years. Like that's the guy we want to follow. We follow him. And, and so they're, they're picking sides based on the personalities of these leaders. And the end result is we have a church here in Corinth that's very disunified because of their desire to rally around specific leaders. Now, here's the deal. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know. Well, actually I do know. I'll tell you why. But it's interesting to me that Paul, the apostle, just doesn't write him off and say, I'm done with you. You follow? Like, okay, you're fighting over, have Apollos, whatever. Like, because if you think about it, and you know this, Paul's a pretty busy guy. Like he's been traveling all around the known world, planting different churches. Certainly there are other people out there that will like him better than the Corinthians do. You follow? Like, it just seems like the Corinthians don't think very highly of Paul at all. It doesn't seem like the Corinthians like Paul very much at all. And, and you've been in situations somewhat similar. You've been in situations where maybe you've been around people and you just kind of get that vibe that, man, these people don't like me. They don't think very well of me. These people, I mean, they're not my type or whatever the case may be. And, and oftentimes when you're around people that don't like you or you think don't like you, what do you do? Well, you try to find some other people that will like you. You follow what I'm saying? And so for me, like here you have Paul, this church in Corinth, they don't seem to admire Paul very much. And it just seems to me like maybe Paul should just... You know, wash his hands clean of them and move on to another church, move on to another group of people. And so then the question does become, why? Why does Paul keep putting up with these people? Why does he keep persisting? Why does he keep writing these letters to them and keep going to visit them? Well, let me show you why, because Paul tells us in the text, you see what it says. Verse one, a person should think of us in this way as servants of Christ and managers of the mysteries of God. Now, when he says a person should think of us in this way, he's talking about, he's talking about himself. He's talking about Apollos. He's talking about Peter. This is how you should think of me, Peter, and Apollos as servants and as managers. Now, if you're reading maybe a different Bible translation than I am, it might be the word steward instead of the word manager. Now, this is real interesting. I don't know if you know much about stewards. I know that, that if you've been around the church, you've heard us talk about stewardship in a financial context. Like you're to steward the money that God has given you and you're to give generously to the church. You've heard us talk about those kinds of things, but that's not what Paul is talking about here. He's saying that he's a steward of the mysteries of God. Now, here's what would happen in an ancient world. Are you with me? In an ancient world, it was not uncommon for a wealthy landowner, and there were those wealthy landowners in that day, to have a steward, to hire a steward or a manager. I mean, you think about it. If you've got a lot of land and in those days you had land and flocks of different kinds of animals and then children and then servants, like that's a lot to manage. And so in those days, what you would do if you were a wealthy landowner that had all of these resources, you would hire a steward to manage over your assets. Maybe that steward would manage over the budget. Maybe he would manage over the servants. Maybe he would manage over your children, but you would hire a steward to help you out because it was a big job as a landowner to own all of these resources. Do you follow me? And so now watch this, watch this. If you were in that ancient day hired as a steward of a wealthy landowner, who did you answer to? The owner, that was it. If you were a steward over the children and the children didn't like you, so what? You didn't answer to the children. If you were a steward over the servants and the servants didn't like you, so what? You didn't answer to the servants. You only answered to one person as a steward. You answered to the master. You answered to the landowner. 
Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? Now, here's who Paul is. Paul is a steward of the mysteries of God, that God in his sovereign providence has chosen Paul uh, to deliver a message to the Gentile people. Many in the church at Corinth, they were Gentiles. God has called Paul to be a steward at, of that message and to what? And to care for these people. That is the call of God on Paul's life, period. And so if Paul is a steward of the mysteries of God, now it's a simple question, but answer it with me, right? If Paul is a steward of the mysteries of God, who does Paul answer to? God. Who else? That's it. So whether the Corinthians like him or not is irrelevant. That's not what matters. What matters is that Paul has what now? Lived faithfully, the calling that God has placed on his life. Let me show you what I mean. You come down and look at what the text says. He says, we're stewards of the mysteries of God. In this regard, it is required that managers be found faithful. Listen, this is so good. Verse three, it is of little importance to me that I should be judged by you or by any human court. Do you see what he's saying? Doesn't matter what you think about me. Doesn't matter if you think that I'm not as eloquent as Apollo's. It doesn't matter if you think I'm not as sophisticated as some of these other people that you like to listen to. It doesn't matter. What matters is what God thinks of me. What matters, Paul says, is have I been faithful to the calling of God on my life? Look what it says. It is of little importance to me that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. That's a really interesting statement. Paul says, it doesn't even matter what I think of me. All that matters for Paul and all that should matter for you as well in the big scheme of things is what God thinks of you. And if you're living out that calling that God has placed on your life, look what it says. For I am not conscious of anything against myself, but I'm not justified by this. It is the Lord who judges me. In other words, all Paul is saying, like, I don't think I've, I've done anything wrong, but, but I'm not the judge of myself. Like, I don't justify myself. It's God. And look at what he says. This is so interesting. Verse five. So don't judge anything prematurely before the Lord comes, who will both bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the intentions of the heart. And then praise will come to each one from God. That's an interesting verse, isn't it? Because what Paul is saying, hey, listen, there's going to come a day when Christ returns. And what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth right now, you don't know. You don't know what's inside of me. You don't know my intentions, right? Like you might think you do, but at the end of the day, only God knows my heart. And someday when Christ returns, God is going to reveal the intentions of my heart. And you are gonna know. You are gonna, and God's gonna reveal the intentions of your heart. Like all those hidden motivations, someday they will be uncovered. God will uncover the intentions of our hearts. He is the judge. And what matters on that day is that you have lived not for the glory of others, not uh, for the sake of others, but for the sake of Christ himself. You see what I'm saying? It would have been very easy, follow me. It would have been very easy for Paul to get his feelings hurt. Because after all, there were people in the church at Corinth that just didn't like him. And it's easy for you to get your feelings hurt as well when you think there are others who don't like you. I get that, that's part of life. But listen, you don't live for the praise of others. You don't live, right, for the acceptance of others. You live for one master, Jesus Christ. And, and just like Paul, you are a steward that God has placed a calling on your life to be faithful to him. And he is the one that you answer to. So let me help you with this challenge, right? First challenge, I want you to be far more concerned with pleasing God than pleasing people. Now don't raise your hand, but let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room would consider yourself a people pleaser? Right? There are probably quite a few of us, like if we really were honest, we would say, yeah, I, that, that's me. Like I'm a people pleaser. Why is that? Why is it that we struggle with pleasing people, wanting to, to please people? Well, there, there's lots of reasons, right? But, but let me give you a few. We struggle with wanting to be a people pleasers because we do want to be accepted. We want others to like us, right? But not only do we want to be accepted and others to like us, we struggle with pleasing people. Why? Well, if I scratch your back, you'll scratch my back. 
If I do for you, you do, you'll do for me, right? Because remember, remember, some of us take the posture of I want to be served rather than to served. And so if I do something for you, then maybe you'll do something for me. If I do this for you, then maybe you will accept me. If I do this for you, then maybe you will think highly of me. So if I do for you, if I please you, then maybe you'll please me. And so we live our lives that way as people pleasers. There's lots of other reasons, but those are a couple. Now, now listen, listen. If you live your life to be a people pleaser, always concerned with what people think about you or if people like you, what's the result of that? I mean, you're exhausted. You're stressed out, right? Because, well, what does he think about me? Or what does she think about me? Or, or, or what do they say about me when I'm not around? Or, 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 or when I'm not with them, like how do they respond? And so, so we're constantly worried and anxious and stressed and exhausted because we're always concerned about what others are thinking about us, right? And then because we want to be people pleasers, are you following me? Because we want to be people pleasers, what will we do? We'll do things that we know we probably shouldn't do. We'll compromise our faith or we'll make over commitments to others or whatever it takes just to get people to like us. Some of us really struggle with that. We struggle with pleasing people. And at the end of the day, we might have pleased others, but we may not have pleased God in the way that we lived our lives. And that's the problem. Because at the end of the day, like all of these people in your life that you're trying to please, that you're trying to impress, that you're trying to get to like you, at the end of the day, they are not the ones who, are going to, who you're going to stand before and give an account of your life. They are not your judge. Now, listen, I get it. Like, I want you to like me. Like, that's human nature. I want you to be liked by others. I get that. But I'm saying when you live for that, that's a problem. Because what matters most is not what others think about you. What matters most is what God thinks about you. And what's helped me is to ask this question. Are you constantly reminding yourself of who you belong to? That ultimately, right, ultimately, who do I belong to? I don't belong to any of you in this room. I love you. But again, I don't give an account of my life to you because I don't belong to you because none of you in this room died for me. None of you in this room rose from the dead for me right? And I didn't do that for you. You don't give an account to me. At the end of this life, I give an account to one, the one who did die in my place, the one who did rise again for me, the one who adopted me into his family. Like that's who I belong to. And that my friend is freeing to know that at the end of the day, that my life is accountable to God himself, that I answer to him and him alone, and that my life is to be lived for his glory, that is freeing. And let me tell you why that's freeing, because when I understand that, that frees me up. Now watch this, come on, listen. That frees me up to love you in the way that God has called me to. Because I'm not now loving you, trying to get something in return from you. I'm loving you, I'm caring for you, I'm serving you right, out of a call of God instead of out of a selfish desire to get something from you. Does that make any sense to you? Do you see what I'm saying? So that's the challenge. Like Paul understands this. Like I'm not here to please you. I'm here to please God. When we um, moved to South Carolina years ago, we, we, we were interviewing with uh, the church I was at before I was here. And so we got through the process of the interview and um, they, they extended the call to us. And so we went to North Augusta for the weekend uh, to meet with the entire church, to preach that in view of a call sermon on a Sunday morning. And they were gonna vote on me being their pastor. And obviously all that happened years ago. And so, so, so on that weekend, I went to that church to preach in view of a call. We had a Friday night gathering where all the members of the church, kind of like we did here. I don't know if any of you were here back then in those olden days, but I did that here too. Um, but, but anyway, we had a Friday night gathering at, at the church and, and, and we opened up the microphone for anyone to ask me a question that night that they want to ask me about being a pastor or whatever the case may be. And, and, and so, so, so I was there and, and here's the deal, like on Sunday, they're going to vote on me. Most of the people there have never met me. So it's their first exposure to Pastor Tommy. You follow? Like this is a big deal. And I want to impress them, 
right? Like at that time I was young, I was like 30 years old, you know? So I'm, I'm young and I'm still fresh in ministry. And so, so I, I wanted to, I want to impress them with my knowledge and my, and my wit and my, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so they started to ask these questions and, and I, I want to answer them just right. And, and the first gentleman gets up to ask the very first question of the evening. And he, he's an older gentleman. He comes to the microphone and, and, and this was the question that he asked. He says, pastor, what kind of manly things do you do? Like, like what, what kind of question is that? You know, like, I mean, what kind of manly things do you do? And, and like, there's all kinds of other questions you could ask. Like, what do you believe about the doctrine of the Trinity? Or what's your eschatology? Or, or how would you manage a church? Or, you know, there's like a million different questions you could ask that are actually important to ask a pastor. And the very first question you ask me is, what kind of manly things do you do? And I'm gonna admit it, like in that moment, like I'm stumped. Like, what, what's the answer? You know, like, I, I don't know if, how to answer the question. Am I, I mean, and my whole ministry could be based on how I answer this question. Like in that moment, I'm freezing up. Like, I don't know how to answer it. So the only thing I could think to say in that moment was like, uh, I married a good looking woman. Does that count for anything? <laughs> and, and, and apparently that was enough. You know what I'm saying? Um, and hopefully it's still enough. I have no idea. But, but, but that's all I could think to say. But I just remember that pressure of, I want to get this right. I want to answer this question right because I want you to like me. That's kind of where a lot of us live. But listen, again, it's not so much about people liking you as, as it is about honoring your master. Now look what else Paul says, we gotta move. You come down to the, the next, next verse and this is where it gets interesting. So, so Paul starts by saying, listen, you're not the judge of me. I have one judge, God. I stand before him, not before you. And then you come down, look what else he says. He says, verse six, now brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos, for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, nothing beyond what is written. Now, I want you to see something real quick and we'll come back up to this passage. You look down in verse, um, the next verse, verse six. I'm not gonna read the verse yet, but look, there's a word there I want you to see, arrogant. You come over and you look at verse 18 and you see that word again, arrogant. We're gonna get into chapter five. He's gonna call them arrogant again. So several times in these opening chapters of this letter, Paul is going to call the members of the church at Corinth arrogant. They think they know better. And so they're boasting, now watch this, watch this. They're boasting in their own knowledge. We've talked about this. They think they know better. They think they're wiser than Paul. They think they're even wiser than Apollos or Peter. Like they know how to judge and determine who a good leader is. They're boasting. We've got this thing figured out. We know what we need, Paul, and it's not you, right? We know what we need, Paul, and it's Apollos. So they're arrogant. They think they've got it figured out. They think they have arrived. And so Paul says, listen, I don't want you to, to let's end of verse five. I don't want you to go beyond what is written. That's probably a reference to the Old Testament. He's probably saying, listen, I want you to understand scripture. And scripture calls you to be humble, not arrogant. To understand, right, that God knows best, not you. Listen to what else he says though. He says, the purpose is that none of you, verse six, will be arrogant, favoring one person over another. For who makes you superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? Now, let's stop right here. Here's what Paul's going to do. This is so interesting to me. Paul is going to compare and contrast his life versus their life. Because at this point, it is very obvious that the believers in Corinth and the apostle Paul have very different perspectives of what it looks like to live for Jesus. Do you understand that? Very different perspectives. For the members of the church at Corinth, their perspective is, man, we've got this special knowledge. Like we've arrived, we know it all, we get it. Like we, we, we can judge, we can figure it out. Like we don't need you, Paul. We have it figured out. Paul's perspective, however, is I don't have it all figured out. And I've got one call. And that call isn't to judge, that call is to serve. And so different perspectives. And so, so Paul's gonna ask questions like this. What makes you superior? I mean, it's biting sarcasm. What, may, what, what makes you think that you can judge me? What makes you think that you can judge others? Look at what else it says. You come down, are you, are you with me? You come down and it says, what do you have that you didn't receive? Now, back in the very first chapter, 
Paul has already told them that this church has received an abundance of spiritual gifts. Like they're gifted people. And so now Paul's asking the questions, what do you have from God? Are you following me? What do you have from God that God did not give you? Like everything you have from God, God gave that to you. So look, look, he goes on to say, in fact, you did not receive it. If, if in fact you did not receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? Like, you know this, he's saying, you know that everything you have is from God, but you're boasting and living like what you have is not from God. You come on, look what it says. You are already full. You are already rich. You have begun to reign as kings without us. And, and I wish you did reign so that we could also reign with you. In other words, what Paul is saying, he's saying you are living as if you have arrived. As if, now watch, you have reached your final destination. Now, just eschatologically, we know what our final destination is. We know that someday Christ is going to return. And when Christ returns, what's going to happen, church? We are going to reign and rule with Christ forever. You, you believe that, don't you? And so what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, you think that's already happened. You think you're already reigning. You think you're already ruling. You think you've, and I wish you would have arrived because I'd like to reign too. But we're not there yet. You have not arrived. Look what else he goes on to say. This is so interesting. For I think God has displayed us, the apostles, in last place, like men condemned to die. We have become a spectacle. Circle the word, word spectacle in your Bible. We have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. Now, interesting. And I don't know if Paul's thinking this when he writes this, but he may have been thinking this. You know this, that, 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 that Paul is writing to the church at Corinth during the time when the Roman Empire was in control. And if you know anything about the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire loved a spectacle. I don't know if you know this or not, but, but before the days of Jesus, in Rome, something was built. Do you know what was built in Rome before the days of Jesus? The Colosseum. Some of you have taken trips to Rome and you've been to that Colosseum. And some of you know the bloody history of the Colosseum. People were put in that Colosseum as a spectacle for others. Oftentimes, condemned criminals would be taken to the Colosseum and put in the Colosseum to be eaten by animals in the Colosseum. Slaves sometimes be taken to the Colosseum and put in the Colosseum as a spectacle to others. There would come a day later on, it's not happening yet, but there would come a day later on that Christians would be taken to the Colosseum and put in the Colosseum to fend for their lives against wild animals as a form of persecution. And you see what Paul's saying. I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle. And it seems like I'm condemned to die, a death sentence that I'm a spectacle, that the world, much like people would gather at the Colosseum to watch people die. Paul's saying it feels like that people, and not only people and angels, are, are gathering to watch me die. You're so concerned about judging and you're so concerned about you've arrived and you've got it figured out. And I'm just trying to fight for my life down here. And so Paul and the believers in Corinth, they have two completely different perspectives. He says, man, you think you're wise, I'm foolish, right? You think you're strong, I'm weak. You think you're honored, I'm dishonored. And you come down, look what else he says. You come down and he says this, up to the present, verse 10, up to the present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. We labor working with our own hands. We are reviled, we blessed. And he goes on to say some other things, but do you see what's going on here? Paul is pointing out to them that he lives a very different life than they do. Now watch, and the kind of life Paul lives is a life that's mistreated, persecution. He obviously faced persecution from people outside the faith. But now watch this, who else is persecuting Paul? Believers, the church at Corinth, the church he founded, the members of this church are mistreating him. Do you follow me? Because they say, no, 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 no. We don't, Paul, we don't like you. We like Apollos better. We like Peter. No, 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 Paul, you're not wise enough. Paul, you're not. They're mistreating Paul. So not only are you following the train of thought here, not only is Paul being mistreated by the world at large, 
but be, he's being mistreated by his own brothers and sisters in Christ. And you've been there. You've been there. You know what it's like to be mistreated by others. And you know what it's like also to be mistreated by those you love. You know what it's like even to be mistreated by people in a church. You know what it's like to be mistreated by people who claim to be followers of Jesus. You know what it's like, we all do. And so the question then is when you are mistreated, especially by those you love, when you are mistreated, especially by those who claim to be followers of Jesus, when you are mistreated by brothers and sisters in Christ, here's the question, what comes out of you? Right? Now, if you live your life in such a way that you're just trying to please people, then what comes out of you when you are mistreated by brothers and sisters in Christ? Come on, watch, watch, watch. What comes out of you is frustration. What comes out of you is anger. What comes out of you is hurt. What comes out of you is gossip. What comes out of you is a desire to want to get even and get revenge. But you also know what Romans 12, 21 says. Do not repay evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Right? Look what Paul says. This is so good and so helpful. Look, 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 look. Paul says this. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we respond graciously. Even now, we are like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage. This, come on, come on, come on. So good. This is the heart of a servant. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure, right? When we are mistreated, we respond graciously because it's not about you. It's not about pleasing people. It's not about being liked. It's about being faithful to the call of the gospel of Jesus Christ on your life. So watch this, watch this. Be far more concerned with how you treat others than how you are treated by others. When you live the kind of life, are you with me? When you live the kind of life that says, hey, I want to be served by others, then you are oftentimes overly concerned about, about how you're treated by others, right? But when you live the kind of life where you're striving to be a servant, servant of God, then you're far more concerned with how you are treating others, regardless of how they might be treating you. Does that make any sense? Because, because, right? Servants of God are willing to endure when they suffer. And you're going to. You're going to suffer in this world. Now watch, and I know you don't want to hear this, but you're going to suffer among the people of God too. Do you know why? Because look around you. Every person in this church, including me, we're broken. God's redeeming us, God's restoring us, but we still do stupid sometimes. And we're still hurtful sometimes. And what happens, right, is that when somebody hurts you or says something that you don't like, the temptation is not to endure. The temptation is to walk away from the church. The temptation is to say, man, I wash my hand clean of this people. I don't need y'all anymore. But that's not the call of God. The call of God is to recognize that even in those days when you're mistreated, you endure. You keep on loving, right? Servants of God bless when they suffer. Because that person who mistreated you, what do they need? They need to be loved. They need to be forgiven. They need mercy. They need you to pray for them. They need you to encourage them. What happens when you and I are mistreated, right, is that we're trying to defend ourselves. We're trying to hurt that person who hurt us. We're starting to hold on to bitterness or where the case may be, but that's not the call of a servant. Because again, you're living for the sake of one who you will stand before and give an account of your life. And the one who you are called to live for, who you will stand before and give an account of your life is calling you in those moments when you've been mistreated to endure and to bless and to remain gracious, to offer the grace of God. You may be, you may be that person that God desires to use to reach that person who mistreated you. You don't know. You can't give up. You can't wash your hands clean. You can't say, I'm done with you because of what you've done to me. Now, I'm not saying to put yourself in a position where you're constantly being walked all over. I'm not saying put yourself in a position where you allow yourself to be abused by somebody else, but I am saying the call of God on your life is to persist in your relationships with others. 
The call of your God, of God on your life is to treat others as Christ has treated you, even when you are mistreated. Because if you think about the gospels, was Jesus ever mistreated? Oh, absolutely. And what did Jesus do? He endured. Praise God, he endured. What did Jesus do? He blessed. Praise God, he blessed. What did Jesus do, right? He graciously went to the cross and gave his life for you. Praise God for that. You see what I'm saying? And so Paul's just challenging us. This is what servanthood looks like. Servanthood looks like, right? I'm, I'm more concerned with what God thinks about me than what others think. And, and, and when people mistreat me, right? I'm gonna treat them well. Last slide, look what it says. And be far more concerned, going to the last one, you don't mind? Be far more concerned with leaving a godly example than leaving a name for yourself. This is so interesting. So you come down, Paul's not done. Verse 14, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. For you may have countless instructors in Christ, but you don't have any fathers. Think about this. Paul could have given up on this congregation. They've mistreated him. They've, they've gone another direction. But he looks at them and says, listen, you don't have many fathers. You don't have someone who loves you and cares for you like I do. And now here, here, here in this room, We've got some fathers in this room and we've got fathers in this room who have what? Been mistreated by their children. You have sons and daughters who've rebelled against you as a father. But what do fathers do? They keep loving. Not only do fathers keep loving, now come on, come on, come on. Not only do fathers keep loving, fathers keep persisting. And this is what Paul says, I'm not giving up on you. You've mistreated me, but I'm a servant of God. Not only am I a servant of God, God has called me to father over you, to mentor you, not giving up. Look what he says. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Therefore, and this is such a big statement, I urge you to imitate me. This is why I have sent Timothy to you. He is my dearly loved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you about my ways in Christ Jesus, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some are arrogant. There's that word again, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon. If the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk, but the power of those who are arrogant. Uh, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you want? Should I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness. Now, just quick, real quick, here's what he's saying. I'm coming. Some of you don't think I'm coming, Paul says, but I'm coming. And I'm gonna find out what you really like, right? Because you're arrogant. You think, man, I've got this all figured out. And I'm gonna come to see if you're actually walking in the power of God or not. Because the power of God, right? Man, you can see it. It's not in talk, it's in action. So I'm coming. I'm coming as a father. How you want me to come? You want to come and lay the hammer down or do you want me to come in love and gentleness? And so this, he's speaking as a father to his children. Do you follow it? But I want you to back up and just see this statement. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Now, I don't go around telling my kids all the time, hey, imitate me, imitate me, imitate me. But in a lot of ways, like I try to live my life in such a way before my kids that I want them to do what I do. You understand? whether it's, it's a household chore or whether it's, you know, how I study or how I approach this, like I'm teaching them, imitate me, imitate me, imitate me. And I hope as a man of God, that I'm living out my faith in such a way that I can say to my sons, imitate me. It's not a prideful statement that Paul makes. Paul's just confident in his walk with the Lord. He's saying, listen, imitate me. So here's just a couple of questions as we end our time together. What in your life is worth imitating? If you are a parent, if you are a grandparent, think about your grandchildren. Think about your sons and daughters. What would their faith be like if they simply imitated your faith? What would your son's prayer life be like if he imitated your prayer life? What would your daughter's scripture study be like if she imitated your scripture study? Uh, what would your grandchildren's character be like if they imitated your character? Like this is what servants of God do. Servants of God live for the master and because we live for the master and our focus is on the master, we should be able to say, imitate me. I'm walking with the Lord, imitate me. But here's the fact of the matter. There are probably some things in your life not worth imitating. For some of us, it would be horrible 
if our children, if our friends, if our coworkers imitated the way that we pray because we're prayerless. For some of us, it would be horrible if, if people we love imitate the way that we share the gospel because we never do it. You see what I'm saying? And so what is it in your life that's worth imitating? But maybe a better question is what's in your life that's not worth imitating? Because those are the areas where you need to grow. Those are the areas this morning where you need to ask God to change you. Those are the areas that you need God to expose to you this morning so that you can begin to grow as his servant that others can imitate. Do you follow what I'm saying? That Paul is showing us in this passage what it looks like to live as a servant. And living as a servant is simply this, right? My life is to live for the glory and honor of God so that others may see Christ in me and imitate my faith as they strive to walk with the Lord. And so is your life one of a servant? A servant who is worth imitating. A servant who is persistent. Because here's the deal too. As you think about this passage, Paul calls the church at Corinth to imitate him. And Paul does not give up, even though he has every reason to, he does not give up in pursuing them. And listen, listen, come on, real close. Come here, come here. There are some people in your life this morning who've mistreated you. And I'm just gonna tell you, I get it. And I know the pain is real. And some of you, have given up on some people who've mistreated you. And that was the wrong choice because God's calling you to persist, to endure, to bless, to be gracious. And so this morning for some of us in this room, God is calling you to identify that person that you've given up on and to restart, to begin to persist again in that relationship, to offer forgiveness, to offer hope, do you follow what I'm saying? And so who is that for you? And how will you follow the leadership of the spirit in that particular area? Or for you this morning, follower of Jesus, what areas of your life is God calling you to grow in so that you can be the kind of follower of Jesus, the kind of servant that says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Aren't you thankful this morning that you serve a God who persisted with you? who loved you so much that in spite of your sin, in spite of your rebellion, sent his son, Jesus Christ, who came to this life world and did what you could not do. He lived a perfect life and he lived a perfect life for you. And aren't you thankful that Jesus persisted with you by going to a cross and dying the death that you deserve? Because every one of us in this room, what we deserve is an eternity in hell. But God loved us so much that he persisted he came after us. And, and if you think about it, Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, like he is the servant of the father. He served us by giving his life for us as a ransom for us and then rose again from the dead three days later so all of our sins can be forgiven and we can be given the gift of life, abundant and eternal through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Aren't you thankful, church, that you serve a God who has persisted in his pursuit of you and is still, my friend, even right Right now in this moment, persisting in his pursuit of you this morning, my friend, if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, give your life to the one who is pursuing you through the death and resurrection of his son. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus this morning. I'll be down front as we have a time invitation. I'd love to talk to you about how you can begin a relationship with Jesus by repenting of your sins and turning to him by faith. And so as we have this time of invitation, as the spirit of God leads you this morning, you respond in faith. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your goodness to us, that you love us and care for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you served your people by coming and living and dying and rising again for us. Now, Father, help us to be servants of others, to not be so much concerned about pleasing people as we are about pleasing you to not be so much concerned about how people treat us because people are going to mistreat us, but to be concerned about how we treat others and to live a life that is worthy of imitation because our eyes are set on you. Father, help us now to respond to how your spirit is at work in us. And if there is one in this room who has never placed his faith or her faith in Jesus Christ, may that person this morning give their lives to you and surrender and ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Would you rise to your feet? as we have a time of invitation together and you come now as the Spirit of God leads you.